You know, I believe that we have some people in our church that really loves going to church, amen? I believe they got saved and they got excited about the Lord and they want to come and worship and sing and praise the Lord. But I'm concerned about the others that may not have gotten saved. And I hope you're concerned. You ought to be concerned about the, those that maybe they come here regularly and it may be because they're, they're a worker and they're required to be here, but they, they wish they were somewhere else. Or maybe they're uh, in the children's home and they're required to be in church, but yet if they had a chance, they would try to miss church, not pay attention, and do other things. I believe we have those people among us, maybe some uh, here, their parents, come to church faithfully, but their children are made to come with them and they're not really interested. And it is my heart's desire for those people. I often pray and think about it. What can I say this time? What can I do? How can I preach? What can I give a message that will reach those people that don't seem to care and be interested? Now, uh, I have an advantage here. Do you know that uh, there are those expert people that read faces? There's people that, that that's their, their, their job, their skill, their talent. They can read a face and tell you all about the person. Y'all know that, right? You've heard that before. And even if you're not an expert, most of us, uh, our facial expressions, our mannerism is speaking to the people and, and, and most people pick up something they'll pick up a message from that person, whether they said words or not. That's how we are. We, we read faces, we read attitude, we read the way they react. And I'm standing up here, and I can see everybody clearer. I can see everybody's face. I can see everybody's reaction. And there's some people that I spend a lot of time praying for because I saw their face and their reaction. They don't sing along with the songs. They got a, a, a board. Man, not again. <laughs> Attitude. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, what we need to realize that the Spirit of God is not going to always strive and tarry with us. There's going to be a time that he'll say, that's it. And he'll move on. And that's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. This is the only time we have guarantee that we can get saved. We have no guarantee for tomorrow. Tomorrow may be too late. That's why the Bible says today. Today is the salvation. And my heart's desire is that someone will get saved. Now, we're going through a study of the Gospel of John. And last time we've looked at John chapter 1... And we looked at the seven names that proves or indicates that Jesus is God. And this is the theme of John. John 20, verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might have believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye may have life through his name. And so we're told the purpose of the gospel of John is that we might believe that Jesus Christ is God and therefore that we might have salvation. That's the purpose of the gospel of John. And so we read, uh, we studied last week, or the week and the week before that uh, the seven names that... John, the author, he brings out in the narrative of the Gospel of John in that first chapter that shows that Jesus Christ is God. And, and this is very important that we gather this because uh, unless you believe that he is, that he is the I am, you cannot be saved. You'll be lost in your sins. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is God. You have to accept him as your God. Now, here, uh, 
Brother Royal, can you open that back door? And let me say that I like for the two doors, I mentioned to the ushers before, I like for them to be open, uh, all the way and kept open. Uh, I want to see uh, right when, you know, at the moment I say, come on, give your heart to Jesus, amen? I want to see who walked out and just went to the bathroom, amen? What, what do you do that for? I'm trying to tell you, you get to come to Jesus. You get up and go to the back. I want to see who's back there. And, who, and then if some people comes in here and decide they want to uh, rob all of us, they would have to gather up. 20 of them will have to gather up before they open the door and come rushing. Well, I can see them before they start gathering, amen? If the door is open. So I, I like to see the door is open, all right? I can see back there and see what's going on and see which one of the children that's getting up walking around in the back. And matter of fact, I like for the ushers to do that, uh, Brother Royal. Every once in a while, y'all get up and walk around and see who's out there doing nothing that's supposed to be in church, okay? Maybe somebody, some of the kids in the children's home or some of the teenagers that came with their parents, and they just want to go back there and, and, and don't want to hear. Listen, what we want we want people to get saved, amen? We want people to get saved. All right. Uh, Christ names, proves that he's God's son. But also we want to look at Christ's works, proves he is God's son. Let's go to the Lord word of prayer. Let me pray with you for a moment. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you and we love you and we praise you. And God, we thank you for Jesus Christ that died on the old rugged cross for our sins. And God, I pray that, Lord, that you'll be with us tonight and just speak to our hearts. And God, I pray that, Lord, for that person that needs to get saved. God, I pray the Holy Spirit of God will move on our heart, convict them of their sin, their need for Christ. Lord, help me as a preacher to be able to bring this message in the power of the Holy Spirit. Help me that I might be understood and the word of God will go forth and accomplish it in our hearts as you have it to. Lord, give all of us a burden for souls tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me also tell you, one of the rules that many Baptist churches have, and it's a good rule, is that uh, you do not eat and drink in the auditorium here. Did you know this Baptist churches have that rule? And they also use scripture where in 1 Corinthians it talks about how don't you have houses to eat in? Do you despise the house of God that you'll bring your food and drinks in the house? That's in 1 Corinthians and they use that maybe it's not as strong as, uh, as they use it but I think it's a good idea, too, because, see, if we bring a Coke inside the church, then it gives the right of every single person to bring a Coke. Can you imagine what our church would look like if everybody had a Coke in their hand right now? And I'm sitting here trying to preach that. Another thing the Bible says that you're not, another thing is you're not supposed to do, you're not supposed to do it also if everybody don't have. Because in 1 Corinthians, it's talking about that some of you have got some and others goes without. And so if you, if you have to eat or in church, you need to make sure you got enough food for everybody, amen? But it's good. And so uh, many of the churches, they have their ushers back there and they stop people and don't let people bring food and drinks inside the church. Now, it shocked everybody. Uh, I was in Manila many, many years ago, and because uh, they, they provide water for the speakers, but the uh, speaker was American at a big meeting that they had, and uh, he didn't want to drink the Filipino water. That was back before, years ago, before they had bottled water so plentiful, and he just came over and he was told not to drink the water, and he told him, I can't drink the water. And so somebody brought him a Coke up here, set it up here. He kind of looked at it strange to see if it's going to be okay. Can I drink a Coke? 
I, I saw that. I thought, that could look kind of strange. Preacher, the speaker drinking a Coke. But um, when we first came to the Philippines, I had six children at that time, small children. And we uh, flew in uh, here to the Philippines, flew into Subic Bay. And then Atita, y'all know, some of y'all know Atita, right? She brought us to Manila because Nana and her had a sister, since has passed away, an older sister that was married to a Japanese that owned a real big restaurant in Manila, a real large fancy restaurant. And they were going to treat us like royalty, like King said, you know, we're the Americans coming over, relatives. And so we go to the restaurant in Manila, and they carried us up to the VIP room in there. And I already told Atita when we first came here that we can't drink the water here because we're, you know, first time Americans are not supposed to drink the water here. They'll get sick. And I told them we can't drink. And so we, what we're going to do is we're going to boil our water. How long do you boil the water for, John Ryan? How many? 15 minutes? So you got to boil the water 15 minutes before we can drink it. And so when we came into the restaurant and we sit down, and all, my six children, all in there in the VIP room, the waitress brought us water. You know that's normal for a waitress to bring water to everybody. I did, I said, no, 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 no. They can't drink the water unless it's boiled. Oh, so they took the water back. And 15 minutes later, they brought us a glass of boiling water, each one of us. <laughs> I just thought, that has nothing to do with the message tonight. I thought since I... Uh, embarrassed and shamed these boys over here for drinking their coke. I'd say something to make it take the pressure off. Amen. All right, let's go to uh, five, uh, seven works that's recorded here to prove that God that uh, that proves that Jesus is God. First work that He did, He created the world. John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made, and in Him was life, and the life was the light of man. And so we see that Word that became flesh created all things. Jesus, the Creator. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. John 1.1 1, 1 said that it was God that created the heaven and earth. John 1, uh, chapter 1 says it was Jesus that created the world. The, uh, the world. And so it is that they're the same. Jesus is God. Amen. Notice what Genesis 1.26 says. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so we see that plural pronoun. And God, the, 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 uh, the Hebrew word there for God is a singular word, but it's a unique word, it's inclusive. And so it says, and God said, let us, a plural word, uh, pronoun, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the Now, when God created man, he created man in his image, amen? And this verse is putting the emphasis on the plural pronoun. Let us make man in our image. God is saying, don't just make him like in the image of God but make him in the image of a plural pronoun God. Let us make man in our image. And so God, man is different from all other animals. No other animals has a body, soul, and a spirit. Only man, because man was made in the image of God in that trinity that God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so man was created this way. Man has a body, soul, and a spirit. A man can experience three deaths. He can experience a spiritual death, and that death has already took place. When Adam sinned, God said, the day that you sin will be the day you will die. 
He did not die physically that day. He died spiritually that day. And so uh, Romans chapter 6 says that whereby is one man Adam sinned, enter into the world, and death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. All men have died, are dead spiritually. And then you can have a, a, a physical death, where we understand a physical death after you've lived, uh, hopefully more than 85, 90 to 100 years, amen? And you die a physical death. It's been appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. All of us will eventually, if we do not live to see the rapture, we will all die physically. And then there's the third death. That is the soul death. That's when, we, we, when one stands before the great white throne judgment of Christ and he, the books were open and the name is not found in the book of life and then that person is cast into the lake of fire for the soul, eternal death. Now, Jesus said, I come to give life and to give it more better. The Bible tells us that if we receive Christ, we will never die. And we're talking about that soul will never die. We will not experience that third death if we receive Christ. And we're born again and our spirit comes back alive. We have a born again experience. Then we do not, we still have a physical death, but we will not have that soul death. And so, uh, they can be a possible three deaths. And so, uh, we need to understand this. And we see here that God said, let us make man in our image. Psalms 35, 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalm 102, 25. Of O has thy laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hand. Isaiah 45, 12. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I have even my uh, hands have stretched out heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. Isaiah 45, 18. For this says the Lord that created the heavens, God himself has formed the earth and made it. He has established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it not in the habit. I am the Lord and there is none other. And so we see that God created the earth. Do you know that this teaching, doctrine, is universally without much education of all. If you have just a little tiny bit of brain, the, the, the worst heathens that's never heard the gospel, that's never heard right and wrong, they still believe there's a God that created because it will not make no sense of anything else. You see, that uh, when you see anything, you see an automobile, you automatically know somebody built and designed that automobile, amen? When you see a house, you automatically know. Nobody has to teach you and convince you and argue to you to say that there is a builder that built a house. You see the house. And when you see creation, you see it, you automatically know they've got to be a creator, amen? They've got to be something started somewhere and somebody had to start it. And all the, uh, the, the Bible talks about scientists, so-called scientists that has made fools out of themselves. And the fool has said there is no God. Only a fool would think of that. Do you know that uh, the Bible nowhere gives an argument for the existence of God. It doesn't try to explain to you how God is and, and, and tells you all the facts and information about it. You know why? It starts off the very first verse. In the beginning was God. In the beginning, God created the heaven. It didn't tell us all about where God came or how he came or his existence because there's no need. It'd be like fool. it will make God a fool. It'd be like me. What if I spent the rest of the night trying to convince you that I exist? 
And I give you all the scientific evidence. I give you all the information. I give you my history. And I try real hard to plead with you and let you know that I exist. You say that I lost my mind. I'm crazy. Foolish. Why would he waste his time trying to convince us that he exists? And so God's not making a fool out of himself. He's not going to try to give an argument of his existence. Only a fool would say that God does not exist. And if God exists... And then he created the world for himself. Then he has to, you see, whenever uh, you, you uh, create something, somebody builds a fan, he has an operating manual that tells how that fan's going to work now. And what's its purpose, what he created it for, what it is to do. Amen? And so when God created the world, he wanted to have some instructions to tell what, what it was for. Why did he create? Why did he create man? Why did he create animals? Why did he create the mountain and the stars? Well, he, he gave us a book that explains to us his creation and his purpose. And that we are to seek his will now. You know, that's what confuses me. Why people don't get saved. Why don't you want to get saved? Listen. You've got to know there's a God, amen? And if there's a God, then there's got to be a heaven. And there's got to be a hell. And why would we play with the chance of going to hell and refuse to get saved when we know there's a God? And that God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. We are to get saved, amen. God is real. And, every, and all that he has instructed us. Is Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Notice that it says that from the very beginning, Creation was created, and who was it created by? Created by Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.16, for by him, Jesus Christ, were all things created, and that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominion or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And so God, Jesus Christ, created everything, and he created for himself. And he has the right to use that that he's created for the purpose he created it for. And we ought to be submissive to it and find why God created us and be why he put us here. Find his will for our lives. Hebrews 12, uh, 1, 2. Has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heirs of all things, by whom also... He made the worlds. His son made the world. And so it proves that Jesus Christ is God because he's the creator. And then another work that Jesus does that proves he's God, he saved, he saves. He gives men salvation. John 1, 9, that was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh in the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And so it is, those that receive Jesus Christ, they are born again by the will of God, not the will of man, and they're born again, they're saved. And that's what salvation is. Salvation is being born again. We die spiritually. When we sin, we can be born again by receiving Christ. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. This is the only way for salvation. It is Jesus saves men. His work proves he's God. His work of creation, his work of saving men. And then third, 
His work of revealing God to man. John 1, 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of the fullness have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him or revealed him. It is Jesus the only person that reveals God to us? The only way we can know God is to know Jesus. And the fact that Jesus reveals God is another work that shows that he is God. And then fourth, his work of creation shows that he's God. His work of saving men shows that he's God. His work of revealing who God is shows that he's God. And then fourth, the fact that he, his work of baptizing with the Spirit. James 1.33, I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same came and said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And so you see that John the Baptist was sent to baptize with water, a picture of of that spiritual baptism. And the spiritual baptism is where Jesus Christ baptizes one with the Holy Spirit in his death, burial, and resurrection. And we're baptized with that, that we identify with him. He comes into our lives and we die with Christ, buried that old person. We're resurrected a new person, born again, and only God could do that. Jesus did it, and he was, had the authority to baptize. And then John the Baptist baptizes only as a pitcher, ducking in the water, showing that dead and buried, brought him up out of the water as being born again and resurrected. John chapter 2. John 1, 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Acts 2, 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues and the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell upon all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And they heard them speak with the tongues and magnifying God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and then prayed they, him, to tarry certain days. Now, we had a pastoral lecture uh, last Thursday up there in that real nice area up there. We thank Chita for her. Thank you, Chita. That was a real nice place you built for us up there. Amen. Now we can have our pastoral lecture. And it was asked that uh, how soon after salvation should you baptize somebody? And I think in looking at this scripture, what we would conclude is, and we mentioned this, is that we can baptize somebody as soon as they're able to show strong evidence that they have been baptized by the Holy Ghost. And so here it is in this context. They begin to speak, and it says, they, uh, and they uh, circumcised, and when Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell upon them and heard the word. Book 46, 
For they heard him speak with tongues and magnifying God. Now, the word tongue uh, is translated several times as the word tongue. Most of the time it's translated language. It would be like uh, the Indians. Remember how the Indians would talk about the white man lying? They said he talked with a farted tongue. And uh, are we going to say, what tongue do you speak in? Or what language you speak? And so it's, it's interchangeable, language and tongue. But what it's saying is they were speaking. They were giving evidence. They were praising God. They were witnessing. They were sharing, telling other people about the Lord. They were zealous and excited and on fire for God. And so it was evidence and people took notice. So look at these Gentiles acting like Christians now. And so the, they were questioned, should, they be, should we allow Gentiles to be baptized? Well, they, they were filled, uh, baptized with the Holy Ghost. They got saved. They got evidence, then we are to baptize them. Amen. But notice, when do they get baptized? Another thing we learned in the verse. They got baptized after they got saved and baptized by the Spirit. After Jesus baptized them with the Spirit. Then they get baptized. Because baptism is a picture. And I, and I pointed that out to them. You know, uh, if you go around showing people a picture of your wife, boy, look at beautiful wife. But you don't have no wife. How can you show a picture of a wife that you don't have? Amen? It can't be done. you got to have a wife first. And so it is. You cannot show the picture of salvation in your life. Baptism is a picture. You cannot show that picture unless you've been baptized spiritually already. And so we are baptized. And look, uh, the way the Presbyterians, the way the Catholics... And other groups, they take a little basin of water and spring, spring it on you. That's not a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. That's not the picture of being baptized by the Holy Spirit, identified with Christ, death, and uh, burial, resurrection. It is only by immersion. When the Ethiopian asked Phillips, what hinders me from being baptized? He says, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you may be baptized. And the Bible says there that they both went down into the water. Now, Philip didn't go out there and get a cup of water and come back and spring. He said they both went down into the water. And he baptized them. He merged them. He dug them down and brought them up out of the water as a picture of being born again, saved. Matter of fact, uh, did you know the word... Bat, uh, baptism was uh, uh, did not exist prior to the Bible, King James Version. It was a word that was created by the translators. The translators of the King James Bible in 1611 was all of them was of the Church of England. Church of England was a split from the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, King uh, Henry the Eighth. The king of England, Henry VIII, he had killed several of his wives, divorced them. Uh, there's a song. How's that song go? Anybody know it? I'm, I'm Henry VIII, I am, I am. I had seven wives and something like that. But it's a song talking about King Henry VIII. Y'all don't know that song? Oh, man. But it was a song the little kids sang when I was growing up. But because the history is that King Henry VIII had about seven wives and had some of them killed. But because of that, the Pope excommunicated him out of the Catholic Church. They didn't want to have this fellow being a member of the church that was divorcing his wife and killing some of them. And so when he got excommunicated, then nobody, the Roman Catholic Church, taught that you could not go to heaven if you got excommunicated. You're going to go to hell. So what he did, he cre as the king of England, he created his own church, the Church of England, and it became the only church that the England recognized. It became the state church. And so uh, as that church developed, and years later, 
the Church of England today, the, the, in England, the, the state church is Church of England even today. All citizens of England has to pay taxes to the Church of England today. That was one of the reasons why we have America. Christians, Baptists, did not want to submit under the Church of England and under the authority of the king. They believed in the separation of church and state. So they left and went to America and formed, and then they wrote in their constitution, the very first is a freedom of religion, that your state could not rule religion. But anyhow, the Church of England, they practiced the same thing the Catholics practice, of sprinkling. So when you translate the, the Bible from Greek to English, they created a word. They did not translate the word. What they did is they did what they call transliterate. Instead of translating it, they just translated the letters. For the uh, beta, they put a B. For the alpha, they put an A. For the pi, they put a P. And for the uh, time they put a T, they just translate the Greek letters to English letters and they create a new word, Baptist, baptism. And so what happened was if you do, if you translate the word, the word translated is emerge. That's what the word is, emerge. And so when you translate the word there from Greek to English and get the word emerge, it messes up their practice. Their practice was sprinkling. So how are they gonna justify sprinkling if the, every time you read your Bible, it, it uses the word emerge? It's a good thing they transliterated though. We'd be called emergers today instead of Baptists, amen? But that's just extra for you to know uh, history a little bit. But, uh, but baptism wasn't sprinkling. It is emerging. It's a symbol, a picture of the new birth. All right, let's move on to the fi uh, fifth work. The fifth work. He, he has intimate knowledge of man. As God, God knows everything, amen? He knows it all. And so it is that Jesus, John 1, 42, and he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, and thou shalt be called Cyphus, which is by interpretation a stone. And so he knew Peter before he ever met Peter. John uh, 1, 47, and Jesus saw Nathan now coming to him and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no God. And Nathan now said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. And so from, a, from a, a, a long distance, long time away, Jesus could see Nathan now, knew all about him before. John 2, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name, and when they saw the miracles, which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself unto the, to them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what is in man. So he knows man. He knows what's in the heart of man. He knows what's in the mind of man. And only God can know you know, um, seance, fortune tellers, uh, people that reads cards, that is not true. I hope you don't believe all that nonsense. Now, there are some tricks, and, and, and the common trick is that they're able to find information about the person ahead of time, or they may have people staged already at, uh, performing as if uh, they didn't know them, but they do know them. But there's many ways they do that. But also there's a way that demon possession and demonic influence, the witch, the fortune teller, has opened themselves up to demons. Now, devils 
And demons cannot tell the future except for what they know that all of us could know. They could read the Bible and they could tell the, uh, the prophecies of the Bible. But what they can do, they can gather a, a, a amount of information. Anything that's already happened, demons and devils can have access to that information. So therefore, they can give that information to the fortune teller. They can tell things of your past, but they're not capable of telling the future. They're not capable of telling what's in your mind, in your heart. They may appear to be because what they can do, they're able to put thoughts in your mind. Now, you do not have to dwell on those thoughts. You can resist those thoughts, but the devil doesn't know that, so there's a good chance that that thought that he put there stayed, and then he could prophesize that thought because he put it there, and it looks like he could read your mind. But he couldn't read your mind because he put it there to begin with. And so uh, there's many tricks, but only God knows our inner being. Only God knows the future. And as Jesus Christ, knowing the thoughts of men, knowing the future, he could only do that because he is God. And then the sixth thing that work that Christ does, he forgives sin. Amen? He forgives sin. John 1, 29, the next day, John sees Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sins of the world. It's only Jesus that can take away sins. Only God can take away sins. Only God can forgive. And it's Jesus that forgives sins and takes away sins. Mark 5, 2, verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And there were certain of the scribes sitting there, reasoning in their hearts, why does this man thus speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? Only God can forgive sin. But Jesus Christ forgave sin. That's because he is God. Now lastly, the works that proves that Jesus Christ is God, the last one, he opens the way to heaven. He opens the way to heaven. John 1, 50. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree. Believest thou that thou shalt see greater things than this? And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Henceforth ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of God. Now, our scripture reading a while ago was read that Jacob, fleeing from his brother Esau, went to take a nap after on his uh, as he traveled tired, and he took a, a rock and laid it down and went to sleep, and he had a, a vision, a dream. He dreamed that there was a ladder that reached to heaven, and on that ladder was angels ascending and descending up and down the ladder to heaven. And now Jesus takes that story as a picture of him providing salvation to man. Him being that way, that ladder. And so you saw the ladder that Jacob saw was a ladder to heaven, a way to heaven, and angels ascending and descending. And here it says in verse 51, And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, his forth, ye shall see the heavens open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Son of Man becomes that ladder. He is the way to heaven. He opens the doors to heaven. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but me. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And Jesus said, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And so uh, let's stand. And I want to give us an opportunity tonight. I believe there are those here tonight 
needs to reach out and come to that only way. Only way. Jesus Christ is God. And he's provided salvation. He created the world. He created you. He has a purpose for your life. You know, there's people, there's, there's a lot of tragedy and things that takes place in, in this life. A lot of heartaches, a lot of pain, a lot of trouble. And the main reason why that is, because this earth is cursed because of sin. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they were driven out of the garden of Eve, the beautiful garden that was plentiful and beautiful and blessed and wonderful. They were driven out of that. And then the earth was cursed. God said that because of their sin, thorns and thistles will spring up and begin to kill the plants. Termites will eat up the wood and, and destroy. They'll be rotten and decay and rust. Thieves will break in and steal. Thieves and murderers. The earth is cursed. We're in in uh, seeing that. And now, do you know that man has tried to overcome it for thousands and thousands of years, that curse? That ought to be another thing that proves our, our Bible, proves that there's God. Because man put a man on the moon. Did you know that? Can you imagine actually going all the way up to the moon and stepping out of the rocket on the ground of the moon. Man was able to do that. And man thought that they could do away with sin, do away with the curse. World War I was described as the war that would end all wars. They thought once we win that war, there would be no wars. There would be no troubles, no fighting. But it hasn't gotten better. And so why? Because the Bible is true. There is a curse on this world. And so that's the reason why we have troubles and problems. But another reason why we have troubles, you see, God wants us to experience a little bit of what hell is going to be like. It's like that if I only knew how terrible, how bad hell is, maybe I'll repent and get saved and not go there. I don't want to go to that awful place. And so God gives us trouble and pain. And the more convincing that we need, the more evidence we need to know how terrible hell is, the more trouble will come in our lives. The more pain, the more suffering. But once we surrender to Christ, they may still be some troubles, pain, but we don't notice it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Because now, with the troubles, I always have Christ there to lift me up. Always there to have Christ to see me through it. And I always know there is a better place. The thing you should do is get saved tonight. Let's heads bow and eyes bow. Why don't you come tonight as the girls are singing? Why don't you just come and give your life to Jesus? Jesus, the God that created the world. God that provided salvation. Why don't you come tonight? You come.